Um, so yeah, thanks very much, and it's great to be the first speaker in this series. Um, I guess like a lot of people um, were managing to do all kinds of talks and uh, discussions internationally without having to clock up all the carbon from flying, which is great. But it's nice to just be appearing across the Pennines as well. Um, so yeah. As, as Chris outlined, um, uh, work with social practice theory in relation to a range of issues that are at stake in terms of sustainability and uh, decarbonization. Um, so in the range of topics I offered to talk about when I was invited to speak to the Tyndall Centre, um, my work on urban mobility is, was kind of thought to be the probably the, the most interesting. Um, and I'm sure I don't need to tell the assembled audience here why we need to change urban mobility. I think that, that's clear. Um, and it's something which requires a fundamental transition. And of course, it is changing even before the pandemic. It's inevitable. I'll talk about the pandemic now and again. Not too much, but some. But even before the pandemic in some places in the UK, the bike boom might have felt like kind of a revolution underway. You go around to some urban centres and it, it feels we're in a place that would have been unimaginable a couple of decades ago. But that relative normalisation of utility cycling in places like London, spreading to other cities in the UK, not least Manchester, there's a lot of exciting developments going on. These are just the latest manifestations of a picture, of course, of constant change in mobility systems. And while we're seeing what might seem like radical changes, there's clearly a very long way to go before you reach a socially just and sustainable urban transport system. Getting through that transition is, of course, going to be deeply complex. It's about change in a profoundly embedded socio-technical system. So uh, how do we understand these processes of change? Clearly, there's all kinds of ideas, all kinds of theories. But the contention I'm starting with is that system transition only happens if enough people do enough things differently enough. On one hand, this contention is kind of very obvious. Uh, possibly undeniable even. But on the other hand, it sounds fantastically reductionist, individualistic, sociologically naive. Those who research the multiscale uh, heterogeneous complexity of socio-technical systems have shown over years now how transitions occur only through the dynamism of relations between technologies, infrastructures, markets, norms, regulations, and other constituents of those systems across spatial and temporal scales. So clearly future transition is not simply about individual choices, about behavior. Rather, we need to pay attention to processes within the complex systems at stake, including how new properties of systems emerge from complex relations between entities and positive feedback effects, whereby processes of change become self-extending. So in the face of that kind of understanding of complexity, how do we accommodate the kind of simplistic suggestion that what needs to happen is people need to do things differently? For practice theory, what people do is never reducible to attitudes or choices or indeed to anything simply individual. Rather, doing something is a performance of a practice. And I'm going to have a few slides that are a bit one-on-one -on -one practice here. And I know there's, there's at least a few names in the, uh, in the attendance list of people who won't need this, but um, just in case, I'll uh, be working some of the basics. And yeah, and those people here who might be able to add some correctives as well. So practices, and therefore what people do, are partly constituted by the socio-technical systems of which they are part. And those socio-technical systems are constituted and sustained by the continued performance of the practices which comprise them. <clears throat> 
So changes in socio-technical systems, including of urban mobility, only happen if the practices which embed those systems in the routines and rhythms of life change. And if those practices change, then so will socio-technical systems. So enough people doing enough things differently enough for transition in urban mobility is not a matter of atomized individuals choosing to do differently. Clearly that's part of the story. You can story any change in the aggregation of individual decisions, but that's not where we find an, the, the essential account of how change happens. So it's not accounted for simply by individual choices. It's also not accounted for by systemic shifts, which somehow occur independently from changes in what people do. Any socio-technical transition has to be a transition in practices. So here comes the practice theory 101. Of, uh, the, the, probably the most frequently repeated definition of what a practice is for practice theory. And this is a bit of a challenge. I think part of the way that practice theory has gained in popularity across social sciences, but also part of the way it gets misunderstood is the word practice, which of course has all kinds of uh, uses commonly in, in general language. Um, so within practice theories, and they are diverse, but within practice theories, the word practice takes this kind of particular um, this particular weight of analytical uh, meaning. So for RecFITs, a practice is a routinized type of behavior which consists of several elements interconnected to one another, forms of bodily activities, forms of mental activities, things and their use, a background knowledge in the form of understanding, know-how, states of emotion and motivational knowledge. So the idea of practice is kind of representing this way in which so many hot heterogeneous elements of social life, of everyday life, relate together, particularly in moments of doing. However, that definition, I think you can, you can read simply as a, a list of the things that we might consider when we seek to describe what somebody does. It doesn't quite account for the fairly grand intellectual ambition that this concept and practice theory carries, that, that practices can be framed as the fundamental unit of social existence. As Shatsky puts it, uh, probably the, the leading uh, source of kind of the philosophical grounding of contemporary practice theory, Ted Shatsky, back in 1996, suggested that both social order and individuality result from practices. So to understand how the concept of practice can carry this much intellectual ambition, we need more explanation than simply what's in that Reckwitz quote. So to me, what is key is recognizing sort of dual existence of a practice that it's dependent, yes, on the aggregation of individual moments of doing but is also something which is necessarily shared and collective. So we can articulate it as practice existing on the one hand as a coordinated entity, something that can be spoken of. It's possible to have a sense of what has to be brought together in order to be able to do the practice, the things, the bodily activities, the know-how and so on. as an entity of practices in some senses, sort of transcendent of individual incidences of its performance, of its doing. However, as an entity of practice can only continue to exist through the accumulation of those incidences of doing, through performance. That's what kind of fills out and reproduces the entity of the practice. So to make a bit more sense of these very abstract statements, um, we can frame ways of doing urban mobility, ways of doing travel as practices. So cycling or driving can be each understood as a practice. So that means that if 
cycling and driving clearly exist as social entities, what Shatsky terms a nexus of doings and sayings. So we can talk of cycling and conceptualize the elements which constitute that practice, the technologies, the materials, clearly the bicycles, but also accessories, the infrastructures that it shares with other ways of doing road travel, road signs, and so on. As a practice that cycling and driving clearly kind of overlap in their social location as means of moving human bodies from one place to another. Each entails particular competences and modes of bodily comportment, distinctive ways of engaging with the world being moved through. They each have their social meanings, norms and rules. So we can represent these practices as individuals who might aspire to do more of it or we might uh, become resistant to it, to oppose its uh, extension socially. But while it exists as this socially shared entity, the practices of cycling or driving exist as an entity only through its continued performance by practitioners. So primarily through people riding a bike or driving a car. So practice theory offers this distinctive take on activity, recognizing it as socially shared as a matter of practitioners skillfully integrating the diverse elements that have to be brought together to accomplish a practice. A corollary of that is the theories of practice decenter the individual. So often practice theory gets enrolled to debates that are around issues that are often framed in terms of behavior change. Um, so behavioral economics or um, psychological approaches. And often when practice theory is worked in relation to issues particularly in policy settings, there's quite a lot of overlap in terms of the particular interventions they come out with, which means they're often sort of confused or seen as easily compatible. But it, this decentering of the individual from analysis is kind of the distinctive move for practice theory to not focus on individual subjects or their attitudes or beliefs as properties of the individual, but instead to focus on practices as shared ways of doing and going on. So through some of the many applications of practice theories to empirical research on the topics <laughs> of sustainability, they've been demonstrated to enable new understandings of past dynamics and demonstrate to reveal the profound embeddedness of patterns of doing. And that's been not least in relation to various aspects of resource consumption, which often get framed as individual choices. However, in working with them to generate insights into change in complex socio-technical systems like that of urban mobility, we need to confront two key misunderstandings of practice theories and I think these misunderstandings follow from some of the ways I've characterized it already. You can see where they come from. So first, not least as a result of the way that understandings of practice tend to uh, give an emphasis to repetition, to kind of the reproduction of a pattern of practice, they can seem poorly suited to understanding change. Second, their focus on the complex details of doing make theories most directly applicable empirically to exploring and describing everyday mundane goings on. Uh, this has been reflected through the great bulk of the empirical work undertaken informed by theories of practice. And it's something which has changed significantly over recent years. It's practice theory has been worked in relation to I guess what you could say are more empirically challenging topics for practice theory, different settings, but still the bulk of work that you read um, in journals, but in PhDs as well, that works with practice theory tends to focus on uh, fairly mundane goings on. So first that question of change, clearly if theories of practice saw performances of practice is always kind of perfectly scripted 
by the entity, by the pattern of practice, then their credibility would crumble as soon as they were confronted with empirical reality. So cycling is clearly done in very different ways, with wide variations, even within the same city and at the same time between different ways of doing cycling. And it's done very differently in different parts of the world. It changes over time. So the practice of cycling as an entity provides the framing, the resources, a pattern for a diverse view of ways of performing cycling. But clearly as practitioners do the active skilled work of bringing things together, there's always scope for innovation, for cross fertilization between different practices and so on, that ends up to processes of innovation that accumulate to changes in the practices entity. So in the dynamics of social practice, a book I co-authored with Elizabeth Shrove and Mika Panza, we developed three key sort of mechanisms of understanding change in practice. So we can understand change in terms of the elements that go into performing a practice, the stuff it takes to accomplish it. And clearly, and when we think of a lot of changes that are bound up in socio-technical systems, but clearly in terms of transport, particularly the most obvious one is technology. And you can often story change in terms of technological change. But for technological changes to affect a practice, they clearly have to be integrated into performances of that practice with implications for the competences, for the meanings that circulate within it. But those elements of meaning and of competence can also be sources of dynamism. The different elements that need to be brought together extend to meanings, competences, and so on. So over any scale of historical view, the things, the meanings, and the competences of a practice co-evolve with each other, with innovation in relation to one sort of element, reconfiguring the relations between elements such that spaces open up for innovations elsewhere. Secondly, there's changes to the population of the carriers of the practice. So that's kind of the practitioners who are recruited to performing the practice. Clearly, the fate of a practice as entity depends upon the success it has in recruiting practitioners able and willing to do the work of integration. involved in performing those practices. So under understanding the decline of cycling in Europe between the 1940s and the 1970s, as a process of defection from the practice of cycling, rather than a simply a matter of changing individual practices, gives a kind of different framing of the processes of change in personal mobility. Thirdly, a mechanism changes how practice is in how practices interrelate one with the other the ways that practices bundle together with others so for example how people tend to perform different practices in fairly sort of familiar routinized sequences through their days the way the practices are bundled in the, uh, the common sort of sequencing of everyday life so the way that course mobility practices tend to be nested between doing other practices mostly we don't do mobility for its own course uh, its own uh, purpose but in order to let us to stitch together the times and spaces for doing other practices that are comprising our day and so mobility changes change in concert with other practices uh, that are codependent with them So these interdependencies between practices only develop through the performances of them. Uh, and these interdependencies extend and can progressively stabilize. They can have what can be analytically understood as kind of feedback relationships, which tend to sort of further embed broader systems. <clears throat> 
And so it's here we find this kind of connection with a practice understanding when we move to bundles and complexes of practice and their tight interdependencies we move into a similar territory to the established territory of socio-technical systems transition theories so appreciating the relations between practices not just interdependent relations but also competitive relations is in fact essential to understanding dynamics within any one practice. Processes of change arise because of shifting the shifting relative location of a practice within what we might term broader systems of practice. The examples around cycling and driving, thinking about the shifting practical constitution of driving or cycling, brings to light how theories of practice have potential to illuminate processes across what, what might be understood as systemic scales, whilst always keeping a grip on how the systems are rooted in, constituted, reproduced through continued performance, mundane, everyday doing. So while accounts of socio-technical systems transition properly refocus attention away from simplistic models of individual attitudes or behaviors, or situate at least narratives of technological change and broader social relations, there's still space to call for conceptualizations of systems transition to pay closer attention to the details of doing. So from a practice theory perspective, I argue at least, uh, systems persist and are transformed only through the flow of practices, of action and doing, which comprise them. Clearly, when you're thinking about how mobility systems change, we're not simply thinking about user, traveler practices, nor are we only thinking about the distinctive practices of identifiable innovators in the way that perhaps a multi-level perspective approach would be interested in the details of doing when it comes to the innovators and the niches of innovation. It's not simply about their everyday doing. Systems persist through the routinized performances of actors throughout the system, most obviously including perhaps local authority planners crucial intermediaries kind of socially in terms of mediation of changing uh, broader social relations and the infrastructures that shape uh, everyday mobility practices. The corporations, the institutions involved in the maintenance, the service sectors for vehicles, all of these things are comprised of the practices of people and the effects of those practices in changing technologies, in changing uh, technical systems and institutions and more. So shifting systemic relations both engender and are powered by this kind of progressive processes of recruitment and defection to changing practices comprising different parts of the mobility system. So the rise of automobility through, through the middle of the 20th century can't be separated from the decline of velo mobility so in places like the UK in the 1940s, cycling in some locations was a dominant means of people getting to work. But that increasing domination by automobility is clearly not simply a story of defection from cycling. Nevertheless, you can see how cycling and driving compete for many of the same resources, if you like. Like all practices, they compete for finite resources of time for the practitioner. They compete for finite space on the roads, 
and in cities. They compete in discursive and symbolic realms between discourses of safety, of health, of responsibility, convenience, and status. Of course, the rise of automobility was not mainly powered by defection from cycling, but also of successful competition with other modes of traveling, along with progressive embeddedness of practices of planning and of regional development uh, that progressively prioritized motor transport and road design. Nevertheless, the decline of cycling from the middle of the 20th century across Northern Europe can be as understood as automobility winning in these systemic level competitions. The defection from cycling and the recruitment to automobility is both a motor of change, but also a, a corollary and effect of uh, broader systemic changes. Jumping to the present day and the bicycle boom in recent years in the UK, I again can't simply be accounted for by looking simply at individual attitudes. Of course, it's dependent on people making the decision at some point to get on the bike rather than to drive or to get on the bus to get to work. But it's, we can't understand it simply by looking at those changing attitudes. Rather, that change is a matter of recursive processes between the practices comprising different points in systems of urban mobility. So the most decisive and visible changes are, of course, infrastructural changes. There's, again, been decades of changes to how roads are laid out and designed to encourage active mobility, but it's only been, it's really since the turn of the century that we've seen more than token efforts at claiming bits of the road that motor vehicles didn't really need for cycling, for example. But in the last two decades, in some locations, we see this kind of radical transformation of at least some streets in the UK, again, the sort of thing that you wouldn't see outside of Scandinavia uh, in the late 20th century. So there's infrastructural, you can story this change in terms of infrastructural change, but those infrastructural changes only change because of changes in practice. For decades, the practices of professional planning have been orchestrated around the prioritization of motor transport in cities in the flow of change within the practices of professional planners, there's been this shift in the last couple of decades. And you see it happening in particular localities and then spreading uh, geographically to what is something of a break point in that kind of narrative of continuing change, continuous change, a shift from the making of space, the taking of space from other practices practices of mobility, but other practices like playing or socializing in the street, for example, taking space for motor transport and this kind of, what can seem like a radical shift in a relatively short historical period to taking space from uh, motor transport and giving it to active mobility. That progressive reshaping of urban infrastructure, and of course, I guess most of you at least spend quite a bit of time in Manchester, and it's one of the cities where you've seen very rapid change and some kind of level of national innovation as well. It's been the first place to do uh, some changes learning internationally. It's not simply that London led and other cities are following, uh, but you can see how those changes in the practices of professional planning in a way have to have that prior work done somewhere else. So 
London learned significantly from Scandinavia, Manchester learned significantly from London, but you see patterns of innovation always in terms of how planners are bringing these innovations into their practices. So shifting professional norms, you can understand how it was just part of being a professional planner was to be part of this kind of prioritization of motor transport through the 20th century. And it's not like we've seen a wholesale shift in planning. Some cities have more struggle as a result of the kind of obduracy of those practices often associated with uh, the individuals staying the same who've been there for decades and perhaps some of them not being open to these kinds of changes. And I know you can find examples of Manchester of the local authority apparently doing two completely different agendas simultaneously in different streets. But at stake there are shifting professional norms, sources of legitimacy and other resources that are needed to do what are often unpopular changes. Ideas, changing institutional divisions of labor, the development of specific competences, clearly learning how to do effective cycling infrastructure takes time and takes uh, dedicated work to learn. We know that from decades of utterly ineffective infrastructural changes. So like in other fields of policy, these changes to professional practices do not sit separate from the systems which they seek to intervene in. These are part of these socio-technical systems. The increased active mobility during COVID lockdown represents clearly a, a moment of disruption. They're interested in these kind of embedded socio-technical systems and the embeddedness of the practices comprising them. COVID, of course, disrupted all kinds of uh, aspects of society and all kinds of systems of uh, social practices it was particularly visible with mobility with increased walking and cycling particularly that tightly coordinated routinized bundle of practices filling people's days unraveled to some extent with lockdown back in spring and it was easier for practices of cycling and walking to recruit practitioners it brought affordances that were newly valuable for people Nationally, while unevenly, of course, a couple of decades of gradual changes in the planning of urban roads made it legitimate for many authorities to take road space from cars for active mobility. Legitimated through more people being recruited, if you like, to the practices of cycling and walking, together, of course, with the uh, change meanings and norms of social distancing with the lockdown. This was clearly, while it's a moment of disruption, what we've seen in many cities is clearly a, a progression of what was already happening and that progression of legitimacy of competences for local authorities to be taking space from motor transport or uh, active transport. And for some authorities, this was an opportunity to implement things that had long been planned, but had met too much resistance. And of course, these changes during the pandemic have been propelled substantially by a strong commitment, including provision of resources from national government. And I'm sure in future histories of mobility change in the UK, that kind of moment will be seen as a decisive shift. Um, not just within the pandemic, but the launching of the sort of two billion pound fund for active mobility uh, transformation that started with emergency <laughs> COVID provision. But that decisive national action can be reframed again as changes in professional policy practices only made possible through the accumulation of legitimacy of competences, the changes of meanings around active mobility that initially started just in particular localities locally. So uh, 
of course, many of the changes we've seen during pan the pandemic have already been shown to not be resilient. Uh, motor transport very rapidly increased and hasn't much decreased with the latest lockdown. And many of the temporary psychopaths and so on erected have been taken down, but it still represents something of a step point in this progression of change. So enough people doing enough things differently enough for transition to happen is not a matter of atomized individuals just deciding to stop driving and start cycling, for example. Nor is it accounted for by systemic shifts which occur independently from changes in what people do. Changes in socio-technical systems only happen if the practices which embed them in the routines and rhythms of life, whether that's the routines and rhythms of home life or of commuting or of working life in a planning office or a policy setting. So if those practices change, then so will the socio-technical system. A focus on practices and particularly on how practices interrelate with each other highlights different sites of intervention to affect change recognizing that change has to happen through changes to practices, ultimately grounded in changes to what people do, offers new insights along with information, new rules, incentives, the recognition of the diverse and distributed relations that come to shape what people do in any given part of the energy system opens up new avenues for intervention. Systems include practices of policy actors and of end users, as well as those shaping technologies, infrastructures, and intermediary institutions. Within this, I recognizing the opportunities for positive feedback that moves uh, systems in a desirable direction as a kind of key opportunity and challenge. That's something you can see retrospectively, these processes of feedback, which just together shift the socio-technical gradients that make certain patterns of travel easier and other patterns of travel harder for people to be recruited to. So yeah, those patterns of positive feedbacks are I think a key challenge and opportunity for analysis of the dynamics of urban mobility systems. I'll leave it there. So look forward to questions and discussion. Good. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a really interesting uh, discussion. I think for some people that, that might be their first introduction to socio-technical thinking and um, sort of the practices approach. So I think it's So have other people also lost Chris Jones? Yeah, I've lost Chris. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> well, hi, I'm Carly McLaughlin. I'm the director of Central Manchester and Chris has had some internet problems he's been texting me about. So um, I'll take over and, and handle some of the questions if that's okay. Uh, and Thanks. just invite, invite people um, to raise their blue hand. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you go onto the participants list and raise your, your hand, if you would like to ask a question of Matt. Or you can tap it in the chat if you're feeling feeling shy. Uh, another Matt, Matt Patterson, do you want to ask your, your question on, on video link for us? Hi, thanks. Thanks for that talk, Matt. Um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an oldish question about practice theory in a way, but it seemed really apposite to me when in the way that you accounted for the sort of cars to bikes dis transition. And it's about the question of power um, and, and whether or not sort of you, 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 the account of that as defection from a practice seems sort of rather heavily euphemistic given the way that sort of bike cyclists were essentially crowded out of public space by a combination of just the relentless rise of cars and the violence effectively or dangers that that posed to cycling as a practice and cyclists as individuals. 
And so I wondered how in that context, and in a way, in a slightly more less, your account then of how the practice, of, how the revival of cycling as a practice has been enabled. Is a similarly violence, it might seem to some a bit excessive at her, but it doesn't seem, you know, I think some, some car drivers experience the dispossession of space from their, them as a sort of, well, dispossession is maybe the word to use, and it is, right? So it's, so there's, there's some form of decisive intervention about the use of space that enab enable both of those transitions. Um, and the word defection from a practice doesn't seem to quite capture that to me. So I'm wondering how you think about that as a the role of power in shaping um, well, shifts in practice generally, but that example particularly. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a challenging question, and um, the challenge of working out how to account for power in practices is something I go at in a book chapter, um, and I'm trying to quickly work out of how that translates to yeah the, the power relations on the road. Um, so I, for a, a for a practice theory approach to power, it's recognizing power as an effect, as of all social phenomena of performance of practices. Um, but it's it doesn't represent something external to the flows of doing. But on the road, anyone who cycles in UK cities, even if you're in Manchester, you can't stay on the Manchester's uh, excellent cycle highways uh, and you have to compete with cars and we are, the cyclists are of course in a disadvantaged relation compared to cars. At play in that is all kinds of different social, role, social practices through which power is performed. Um, you've got that moment of interaction in the doing of driving and cycling, and there's clearly power there. It, it goes without saying in that relation when you've got half ton, ton heavy weight uh, machines capable of traveling at 80 miles an hour compared to fleshy uh, bicycle riding humans weighing about 100 kilos. But the divisions of road space are clearly an outcome of broader, uh, broader relations of practice, most obviously with the, the practices of city planners. And you can see those practices as powerful in shaping infrastructures and, and so shaping the flows of practices, including shaping the uh, power relation between bikes and cars. And yeah, you, you see that, as you say, in the reactions to the interventions that planners more recently made to kind of redress that balance through hard infrastructural efforts to protect cyclists from cars to separate them. Um, And it, you can story that in terms of a, a resettling of, of power relations, but those power relations are always a matter of patterns of doing. Uh, it's, it's a matter of somebody changing uh, what they do, uh, most, whether that's in how they travel around the city or in how they do uh, the work of planning to do that or changes to the work of the people who install and maintain the infrastructures. Great, thank you. Um, do I have any other questions? Um, I'm looking out for them either in the chat box or by you raising your blue hand. Uh, Will, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, um, hi. Uh, Will Fitzpatrick here. Um, I just want to ask really about the position of planners within this social technological uh, environment. What I, I've spoken to several planners 
and I get the impression that they're very much part of the uh, practice and the social technological environment. So it's a question of how they can be broken out of, of the environment which they sit and uh, ch make changes themselves. So I just wanted, wondered if you had any thoughts on, on that part of it. Thanks, Will. Thanks, Will. Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. So city planners uh, involved in planning roads are obviously kind of crucial, uh, occupy this kind of crucial location in the uh, uh, socio-technical system of urban mobility. Um, and it's, it's critical to see them as within that system, their own, the practices comprising planning being shaped both by what is the, the practices of mobility within the city and uh, the calls on them that result from that, if you think how they respond to traffic congestion, for example, the way in which they respond is a matter of shared professional norms and expectations and repertoires that reflect the profession at the time. I think if we're we obviously have the kind of empirical opportunity to understand how that changes because it has changed. And looking at the way in which uh, planning shifted in London, particularly through the 2000s and continuing um, through to continuing innovations today, the way in which change has been affected in Manchester. So I brought a student field class to visit uh, transport for Greater Manchester um, planners and had a really good chat with them and you know they could kind of present how as a authority they were reshaping how they were doing transport planning but if, it, just a bit of pushing at how they relate to other planners in the Great Manchester Authority showed that it, it's a matter in a way of institutional shifts, re, reworking uh, dis distributions of responsibility within city planning to make space for different ideas, different norms, different routinized professional practices of planners, if you like, to take root. Um, I think there's a, one of the many um, research projects I'd like to be doing, but <laughs> there are too many, uh, is on how these practices travel and change across space. That question of how, how did planners in London gain the legitimacy and the competence to start to affect change? Uh, how did those ideas travel to Manchester? They're now traveling to Sheffield. Sheffield's as off, so often as a good few years behind Manchester and things like this, and it, but is getting geared up and demonstrating real commitment, particularly at the level of the city region, on active mobility change. Um, so I haven't got an easy answer on how you change. Clearly, there's, there's people nearing retirement who've always been doing transport planning in the same way and still pay attention to the statistics on flows of motor vehicles and having spent most of their working lives without any availability of statistics on pedestrians still don't pay any attention to them and they're just going to work their time. Other planners clearly are ready to or are amenable to changes in those professional practices. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions in on the chat which I shall read aloud um, and I'll try and close just a little bit before two um, to give people a moment before probably their next Zoom call. Um, so I'll, I'll just go for both of those, these questions at once, Matt, if that's okay. Yeah. From Claire Houlihan, um, she asks, from your perspective, can you envisage what might be done to help preserve and extend sustainable practices that have arisen during the pandemic? And then from Susan Lee, from your work, do you see the devolution agenda as beneficial within the UK to enable a more rapid transition to improve mobilities? Globally, a lot of action tends to happen at the city level as opposed to the national level. Thanks. Two good questions. Um, and the second one's easier, so I'll go for that first. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, 
there's a question of appropriate scale of governing um, for affecting different kinds of systemic changes and with mobility as with quite a lot of issues around sustainability the scale of the city um, and particularly the the developed authorities like the, the city regions of manchester and of sheffield not just the city but also the suburbs and satellite towns and thinking those through together in terms of mobility is absolutely critical um so far as with devolution those authorities have the capacity to act um you are seeing some of the most rapid change and innovation so that happened in london it's happened in manchester it's happening in sheffield of course it's going to vary depending on the commitment particularly of the leadership of city regions um, but it's demonstrated that that kind of innovation i think happens best at the city level I, with the uk government commitment to active mobility this year it shows that you know while the innovation happens there there's you need the national level as well particularly in the kind of distribution of responsibility and authority in somewhere like the uk um and local authorities where there wasn't any momentum around active mobility have been more or less compelled to take action already this year so yeah absolutely cities are probably the most important place for innovation change to happen at pace but uh, it's a question of how that's shared to other authorities that don't have the same sort of capacity or uh, momentum. How we maintain the shifts, Claire, uh, is of course a really challenging question. Um, it's clear that infrastructural provision shapes how people travel and uh, many temporary cycle paths have been taken out again i mean some of them were put in too quickly and just weren't planned right and like any infrastructural intervention it's it's got to be planned right it's got to be suited to the, the place and an understanding of uh, local uh, expectations so but maintaining those infrastructural advances that have been made where they have made a positive difference will make a big shift um and where there's the kind of authorities that have the capacity for doing it really taking steps to help that normalization um practice theory often ends up sort of criticizing uh, communication efforts as if just changing information will will change what people do but changes to information and changes to uh, through publicity are part of shifting meanings if they, they fit into an understanding of changing practices. So there is clearly scope for messaging that helps to kind of embed the normalization of uh, active mobility. Great. Um, we just had one quick extra question that I'll get you to say a, a quick word on before we wrap up. Um, from Alan Boyd, do you think Actor Network Theory offers anything to practice theory as regards to urban mobility? Can you can you capture a quick feedback to that and follow <laughs> that, up that, that with more detail? That could take a very long time, but in brief, yes, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I think the way some of the kind of key principles of Actor Network Theory have informed different strands of contemporary practice theory in really productive ways. I think. Um, it, particularly in terms of understanding kind of relational agency, uh, including in relation to technologies. Uh, but some practice theorists have had a lot more difficulty with that than others. Right, that, that <laughs> a was a very minute response. What could have been a long and complicated answer. Thank you for, uh, for, for shortening it. Um, okay, great, thank you very much. Thank you to Matt. Thank you to everybody for attending. We'll be in touch with our next Tyndall seminar, which is planned for around the middle of January, but we just don't have details quite confirmed yet. So we'll be in touch and we hope to see you all there. Thank you, Matt. Thanks very much. And yeah, it'd be great to see people in person sometime. <laughs> you certainly would. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye.